International Association for Near-Death Studies presents NDE Radio, a weekly exploration of near-death experiences and similar encounters with the other side. Now, here's your host, Lee Whitting. Welcome to NDE Radio with Lee Whitting. Whether you're listening on TalkZone by podcast, through the archives of our ad-free shows on our YouTube channel, or connected through the incredible content of our Facebook page. Our guest today, Reverend David McGinley, is a chaplain and interfaith spiritual counselor at the QE2 Health Sciences Center in Halifax, Nova Scotia, and the author of Beyond Surviving, Cancer and Your Spiritual Journey. David is a certified specialist with the Canadian Association for Spiritual Care, a minister with the Evangelical Lutheran Church in Canada, and a member of the Canadian Association of Psychosocial Oncology, the Canadian Hospice Palliative Care Association, the Atlantic Therapeutic Touch Network, and he's been a conference presenter at IONS as well. David has survived cancer four times, which led to a profound near-death experience and explorations in consciousness and the connection of the body, mind, and spirit. With degrees in philosophy and through his ministry, David has found a deep sense of purpose in supporting others in their spiritual journey. David, welcome to NDE Radio. Great to be with you, Lee. I really love the show. I've been an avid listener, so it's an honor to become a guest. Oh, well, I'm certainly glad you're, you're going to add a lot to our 450 shows, believe me. Uh, and I'm basing that on the wonderful conversation we had yesterday. David, uh, tell us about this rare form of cancer and, and what happened when it spread to your femoral artery. Yeah, this is, um, this is a weird cancer. It appears in one in every two to three million cases, and it's called uh, pheochromocytoma when it's growing on the adrenal gland, and it's called paranganglioma when it's growing out anywhere else. And I have paranganglioma. So imagine a, a cancer that doesn't spread out or metastasize and compromise your body's systems. Uh, instead, this one sits as a tumor, a gelatinous tumor that makes a Molotov cocktail of chemicals, norepinephrine, dopamine, uh, catecholamines. And when your adrenal gland turns on, it's like a switch and it throws the right switch and lights the fuse and the tumor blows. So all of these metabolites flood into your system. Most people die in about a minute, and then it's diagnosed afterwards. Wow. So you don't die slowly from this cancer. It's a kick in the gut and down you go. Um, I've had it four times, which gave me the dubious distinction of being written up in medical textbooks. That was the first time I'd been published. Uh, the first time I was 17 years old. And it was growing in my bladder. So the metabolites were flooded out with my urine. And I didn't have any uh, effects. I didn't feel the hit. I didn't feel my blood pressure go up, my heart racing, my, right, my, my um, head becoming clouded. I didn't feel any of that. But the second one, I uh, was 27 years old. And I was on internship as a student minister. And that one blew uh, and sent me to the great beyond. Uh, gave me a glimpse. The third one, I was 35 years old. And then the fourth, I was 38. So the, the second one was on my femoral artery, which means major blood vessel, major highway. That's why it was so dramatic. The third one was uh, a tumor in my uh, abdomen, but it had started to spread to my lymph nodes. And the fourth was in the in the lymph nodes in that area. So because of all the surgeries, I have some artificial parts inside and they're all working fine. And I live to see another day. A lot of people die on the operating room table too, because mm. when the surgery and surgical team goes in, they're the bomb squad, right? And as soon as you touch this thing, boom, it goes and you're gone. So they had to lower my blood pressure every time to about uh, 50 over 30 and hold it there to give me as much headroom as possible when they extract the tumor, it blows, my blood pressure goes crazy, then they give me other medications to bring it down again. And then you got this roller coaster ride. And if you come out, you live to see another day. Wow. Well, you, yeah. uh, it's emotional excitement that sets it off. And uh, 
you managed to collapse in the pulpit pretty much at a at a, a seminary <laughs> chapel <laughs> chapel's uh, session, I guess. I, I you know when I was in seminary, I can well remember how stressed I felt when I was expected to stand and deliver a sermon, and uh, and I guess you had an, a couple of times when you uh, just collapsed in the pulpit. Yeah, man, you know it. Public speaking is one of the most anxiety-provoking things you could do. Yes, and when yes. you got a parent ganglioma in you, uh, you're taking your life in your hands every time you step in the pulpit. Yeah. And you didn't so, even know the first couple of times what it was that was doing this to you. No, I didn't. Uh-huh. Um, I, have, I have passed out in the middle of a sermon numerous times. Now, I put a lot of people to sleep giving a sermon. It's no good when I become unconscious (laughs) delivering one. (laughs) Well, the attack you had when you were 27 led to your Mm. near-death experience. So tell us about that one. Yeah, uh, fortunately, it was in a hospital chapel that I I collapsed, and that's a good place to die. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, I was getting up to give the sermon. I could feel the effects of the, the, the tumors, the chemicals going through me. I was beginning to get dizzy. I was trying to breathe into it and stay with it because I was determined not to pass out again, right? Uh, every time I got excited, exercised, uh, angry, uh, anytime my adrenaline was, was, my adrenal gland was activated for any reason, it could make the tumor blow. And I, minor attacks would just double me over in pain, but major attacks would knock me right out. So I was getting up to do, give the sermon. I'm just getting into it, and down I go. I was unconscious before I, I my head, head hit the floor. Now, I, whenever I, I share the story, I always emphasize, I am a tall dude. I am six <laughs> feet, eight inches tall. Wow. Right? So the joke is that I'm the high priest, right? <laughs> <laughs> but works for it's me. A long way, it's a long way down. <laughs> but... <clears throat> the concussion is is pretty pretty intense, but I, I was out. I was gone before I hit the floor. Wow! Suddenly, I found myself on a grassy hill. I did not have an out of body experience or the tunnel of light. I was when I describe it, it's always so simple and ordinary. A grassy hill with a tree at the top, but it felt extraordinary. It was incredible. I felt every blade of grass as it was moving. I felt the light flowing through me with love, right? I felt all emanating from love, right? And if God is love, then I always say, love is not an emotion. Love is the highest state of consciousness. So I was one with love and one with the tree. And I really wanted to run to that tree because I knew if I did, I'd never come back here, right? So I knew I wasn't here. I was home. And that's exactly what I said. I was jumping up and down with joy, saying, I'm home, I'm home, I'm home. (laughs) I was, I was so happy. And um, David, describe the scene a little. Was it was the sky light or dark? Was the tree illuminated? Did things glow? Any description I give is going to impoverish the actual experience and, and the poverty of words cannot encapsulate or capture the dimensions of this reality. However, there were clouds in the sky. There was a a dramatic light, um, or maybe that's how I felt. The tree was reaching its branches out, drinking in the light. I could feel how it was doing that. The grass was swaying with a breeze, right? And I felt every blade, the colors, beyond any colors here, Uh, Not that they were more vivid. When we say that, we're trying to say it's more real than anything here. This is a cardboard cutout two-dimensional reality compared to that. Mm -hmm. And I was finally real. There was no part of myself that I was blind to. Here, talking to you, I have a fractured consciousness. Part of me is thinking about how my day went at the hospital supporting patients who are dying. And part of me is excited about what we're going to be talking about. And I'm thinking about a variety of things. 
And there's all this material that my subconscious, I'm not even aware of, right? And it's stirring. Uh, I am not integrated, but there I was, I was authentic, I was congruent, I was whole and complete, which, as you know, technically is the meaning of the word salvation, right? Yes. To be, to be whole and complete. So I was that, and I was one with everything. Wow. Oh, that's so good. Um, and I wasn't alone. There was a person there, a masculine figure. And I didn't, people say, well, what do you look like? And I, I didn't really look at him. His appearance wasn't important, but his, his consciousness, his connection to me was everything. I, he felt like my best friend. Like we'd known each other all of my life and he had known me longer than that. And I felt so relaxed and overjoyed in his company. And he said the first words, you know, I'm jumping up now. I'm saying I'm home, I'm home. And then he says, welcome, David. It's so good to see you. Oh, <laughs> oh. <laughs> implying it, it that like you'd, a, you'd seen him before. Yeah, it was like a reunion. Yeah. And um, I said, I'm home, I'm home. It's great. Come on, let's run to the tree. Let's go. <laughs> and, and he said, no, you, you can't go out there. Let's walk. And I said, no, come on. I'm here. There's the tree. We got to go. And yet I couldn't compel my feet to run. There was a power in his presence and authority that rooted me to the moment and to stay with him. I felt like a kid at Christmas, you know, about not eight years old. And um, he, he just calmly and beautifully and lovingly walked along through the grass with me. And he said, it's okay, let's, we need to talk. Let's talk about your life. And he basically said, you know, things are going very well. You wouldn't think that in the moment with my body dead on the ground or on the floor. Mm -hmm. I apparently had been gone in total. It, it turned out to be 15 minutes, no heartbeat. The doctor and the nurses were there. They were doing CPR. They were trying to resuscitate me. They, um, they had cleared out all the people from the chapel. Um, but I was having a great time. I was home. And uh, he said, things are going very well, meaning my life. Uh, but you can't stay here. You have a lot of work to do. And I said, that's ridiculous. Why on earth wouldn't I stay? He said, you got to go back, but we will be with you. And I protested. I, I said, no, no, I'm not going. Why would I go back there? This is everything I've hoped for. I want to go to the tree, right? There's always this or usually there's this border, there's this point at which you know, if you cross that, you can't come back here. Mm -hmm. I, oh, I wanted to see what was on the other side of that hill at the tree. But he, uh, he said, you can't go up there. Mm -hmm. I felt, I felt the authority of that there. Yeah, when people say, what does he look like? I, I can describe him. But, yeah. He looked like power, authority, compassion, love, tenderness, great sense of humor, wonderful, best friend. And they, they, people say, well, David, that, that sounds like Jesus, don't you think? I mean, you're a minister. Don't you think it was Jesus? And I'm like, I never for a moment thought it was Jesus. I, I always joke. It was, um, you know, Joe from the warehouse or a junior apprentice, right? <laughs> they, they wouldn't send the big guy to me. But he was no less imbued with the character of the Christ, right? The Christ consciousness, the connection to everything. And then he, it summed up, he, he said, you can't stay here. You have to go back. And my heart was just sinking. And he felt that. So he reached out his arm and he put it on my shoulder. And I felt this love pour into me. So, mm, so like, he was infusing me with energy of himself. And I just felt enfolded by that grace. And he smiled and he said, it's going to be okay. We will be with you, plural. Isn't that interesting? Yes. And we'll see you later. Boom. I was back. Wow. Lee, um, coming back is the hardest part. 
everybody says this, right? You, you've moved from this level of consciousness to one so expansive, and then you're stopped back into this muck. And you have to talk with your words coming one after the other, and your thoughts are completely inadequate, and, and you're bumbling to impart yourself to another. And there's this synthetic separation that's just not real, and you're stuck in it. And you have to work with time and gravity. And oh, it's utterly inadequate compared to that. The, you, when we talked yesterday, you talked about the, the weight of the body. And I think you said the poverty of the flesh and the clumsiness of words. And I've been thinking overnight, is this some of the reason that we are so fallible, so prone to depression, so screwed up in in our lives is it because we're dealing with the physical body itself no i think it's because we're dealing with the illusion of separation from the divine and from everything Uh, we perceive ourselves yeah you perceive yourself as separate Mm -hmm. and um yes that is a required dimension of the evolutionary journey of the physical experience but uh it it has a, a gravity that pulls us into a mythology of identity that I am separate from you and we are other than, you know, the, the world around us. And then you've got the emphasis in Western culture on individual and autonomy and personal liberty and all of these things, reinforcing mythologies of your rights as an individual uh, upon which cultures are based. But if the underlying reality from which ours emanates is one of pure consciousness and absolute connection, then there is no me. There's only us. There's only everything. Coming back with that realization, did you uh, feel compelled to tell anyone about your experience? And if you did, what was the reaction? Well, you got to be joking. I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't figure out what happened to me. No way am I going to, like, I, I'm honored. That's a chaplain. I hear near-death experience accounts every month. People tell me because I ask them directly and, it, and it's fresh. But this was 30 years ago. I didn't know what to do with this. They wrapped me in a blanket. They took my vitals. They gave me some orange juice. They couldn't find anything wrong with me except a bump on the head. So I chalked it up to anxiety and nervousness and I went home and I crawled into bed and I grieved. I didn't know why I was crying. I didn't know why my heart sank into this physical emptiness. I I didn't understand. And I pushed it down. It descended into my subconscious immediately because this is not cognitive dissonance. It's existential dissonance. And you've got to choose the reality you're embedded in. So I was like everyone else. It takes on average 10 years to integrate the experience. And that's what happened. It started rising over the years. I did not tell anyone or get into the pulpit and preach it. It took me so long to integrate it. Well, there you were studying at the seminary, all the doctrinal theology. Did it Mm -hmm. begin to uh, change your understanding of that theology? It did, but that happened after I graduated. Uh, And when I went into the field, had a parish, and learned how to love. You know, he told me I wasn't ready. I had a lot of work to do. I now know I had a lot. I had to grow up. I had had to mature in in love. I I just wasn't ready for all that. And, And my job is to help other people do that too. Not that I'm a master, but here I am supporting people at the end of their life and I'm helping them not so much with their belief system as with the unfinished love story because God is love. Uh, So it took me a long time to find the vocabulary, um, a new modern contemporary vocabulary of spirituality, of consciousness, of the nature of reality. and that reconciled my scientific 
spent with my spiritual desires. And uh, I've emerged now with a new model I feel is much more robust and relevant to the age we live in. You said yesterday it blew the doors off the doctrines of theology that you'd studied. And, I'm, and I have felt uh, the same way about my, you know, comparing my NDE to what I studied at seminary. And I, I wonder, at some point, you and I should talk about how we might revitalize seminary teaching to uh, incorporate the reality of consciousness as, a, as, I think you called it, the only realm we share with God. Yeah, the consciousness is the only real estate you share with God. Mm. So invest wisely, right? <laughs> yes. Uh, so, so what do you think? What is, how does it impact on the doctrine of atonement? Oh well, you, you you explained that to me. I thought it was I thought it was excellent how you uh, broke that word down. I had seen that oh, before, but I never really thought much about it. Oh right, uh, at one minute. Yes. Right to be one because. You look at the word Christ, that's not his last name. It's a title. And while in the church, we talk about it means the Savior. Well, what does that mean? The Christ means the everything. Right? I think of a passage after the resurrection where the disciples, there was nowhere the disciples could look where they did not see the imprint of the Christ. Suddenly their eyes were opened and they saw the divine in everything because everything emanates from consciousness, from the divine. Yeah, that's the awakening. It takes the copyright off the whole issue of salvation. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I think you also said that the divine is love, not the promise. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, God is love. So... So, so where it, where do the churches get this wrong? I mean, it's it seems when you've when you've seen it, it seems so obvious. Oh yeah, but come on, man! Power, empire—it's so juicy, it's so tempting, it's mm -hmm. delicious, and it and it just grabbed hold right away. Like back with the disciples, they were walking on the road with Jesus when he was trying to teach them how to love, and they were bickering and arguing between themselves: who's the best? Who's the greatest? Who do you really love? Right, mm -hmm. and. Uh, then that continued after his death. There was a split with Paul who wanted to preach to the Gentiles and, and um, he felt like he wasn't accepted as a, a valid disciple. And hey, for good reason, right? He used to slaughter the Christians. He was a, he was a, a zealot, a Pharisee who was brutal and uh, committing you no know, type of genocide. And then he gets this vision of the Christ, the consciousness coming to him on the road to Damascus. And he goes, uh oh, uh, and he's transformed. Yeah. But he, he, he's like, who am I? Uh, I'm, I'm not a, one of the original disciples. And yet, you know, I've got to, I'm compelled. And then it, separation continued with the rise of empire and the adoption of the church as the state religion and then the councils and got to keep control and can't let these mystics who have direct experience of God go running around willy nilly, just preaching love for everything. <laughs> the, the, the story is though, that the early Christians had the sense of, uh, of community and sharing that uh, when somebody needed something and you had it, you gave it to them and it was, it was cooperative. Yeah. Um, and uh, it worked for a while. It did for a while, but you're right. Power corrupts even in, maybe especially in religions. Yeah, each ego will do anything to hijack a spiritual agenda. And the more power and privilege you have, the more likely that's going to occur, especially since I am the person most likely to deceive myself. So I will rationalize my actions if they're going to elevate my ego in the service of, uh, seemingly in the service of humanity or, or of God in the church. Oh, there's a whole history of that stuff. Mm. I think you said it, it's not about being good. It's about, it's about being authentic. Talk yeah. about that a little. Yeah. If God is love, then love is your spiritual practice. And the goal in life is not to be good or, re, or in control or calm or popular or anything. All those are aspects of the ego. The, 
the task of life is to become authentic, totally real. Mm. That requires great humility. Because a, a good day for your spirit will be a bad day for your ego. Right? Um, to put yourself aside and be this instrument of light and love. To get out of your own way. That, that's, uh, that's the goal. Yeah. Mm. And that's uh, the loss of humility may be the reason that uh, the, the church uh, can be the downfall of its uh, hierarchy. Um, who emphasized this notion about being good and uh, that uh, Jesus' sacrifice for our atonement is the, is the key rather than this yeah. at one minute that you point out. So the, it's my near-death experience changed my perception of the cross, not as um, Jesus dying for our sins, which is borrowing or adopting an ancient sacrificial model from the Jewish tradition and prior, right? It goes way back. Instead, I see it through a rather Buddhist perspective. In the Buddhist tradition, uh, the highest goal or uh, attainment in life is to become uh, a bodhisattva, which is a warrior of compassion. And that is one who can stand in the storm and drink in the pain of others and return compassion and love, not in an effort to transform and change that person, but simply to incarnate that sacred presence that says, I am here and I am with you and I will not abandon or diminish you. I will not turn away from any part of your pain. And through the quality of that presence, you are a transformative force of grace. That's a Buddhist notion. It's in the Christian tradition. In the Catholic tradition, it's called redemptive suffering, right? where I take in the pain of the world and I offer it up to the Christ, the consciousness, and then I breathe in that divine consciousness and I send it out to that person. But the church has missed or, or tripped up, right? Because now that has become petitioning to an external God instead of participating in the consciousness of God, which was the teaching of Christ in the first place. Come on, in the Garden of Gethsemane, right before he was arrested and crucified, he says, may they be one even as you and I are one, you and me, us and them, them and us, right? Unity of consciousness. From that, miracles flow. But we get in the way because we think we know what to do. We ain't that smart. Would you call compassion and love the same thing? Um, I would call compassion, love, and action uh, to suffer with. But love is this entire state of consciousness that I am evolving into and yet that I fully am already. Um, yeah, it's weird. It's a paradox because from the inside of my experience, I'm just bumbling along every day. It's amazing to contemplate that that's probably the best way to shine. <laughs> uh, um, one thing that you also described, which I thought was fascinating, is that uh, God is Trinitarian to model relationship and that it takes separation to realize love to in the fullest. Yeah. Talk, talk about that a little. Oh, it's wild. It certainly ain't my idea. I'm not that smart. I think I got it from uh, some author, but it's not enough for God as love to be. That is a creative force that by its nature will express self. So then God, boom, separates self from self. And then there is another, right? So God or, and son, or you can say God and boom, universe. And as soon as there's two in a relationship, there is automatically a third which is the dynamic and energy flowing between. We could call that spirit, the creative force. So as God conceives, spirit creates and the sun experiences or the universe experiences. So too with us, uh, as our soul conceives, our mind creates and our body experiences, and we manifest a reality collectively. And I think this is the required process of creativity itself. 
infinite separations of God's self from self to reflect back upon self and have experience and inexperience expanding consciousness. So we are the experience of God, except mm. we're pretending we're not. <laughs> mm. We we don't see it that way at all. Oh no! But but, uh, but it makes so much sense to yeah. And I wonder but, what uh, I wonder what God thinks of his experiences. Oh, I don't want to think. I don't want to imagine that. <laughs> I, I like to say, if if the kingdom of God is within me, he better find some better real estate. Well, wow. yeah. Well, here's something I wanted to ask you. Um, if the power of of love is that intense, I know people. Uh, some NDEers have just wanted to merge with the light, to lose themselves in the light. And now we're talking about separation as a matter of uh, the mechanics of consciousness uh, or love manifesting itself um, that, that, we, that you just described. But do you think our ultimate goal is to lose all our ego, all concept of self, and just merge like a drop of water into the love of God? Um, I'll find out one day. <laughs> <laughs> I think that ego is required for the evolutionary journey of self. In, and in order for there to be growth, there must be struggle, challenge. Uh, so I look upon the, a healthy ego is a container or a chalice. And into that is poured the sacred consciousness, right? And it is, so it's expressed and held in each person's individual way through the formation of their identity. But the ego becomes unhealthy when it fills itself with itself. That's a good model. Um, as soon as we come into the world, we begin the process of ego construction. Then this is beautifully explored by a brilliant author, uh, hospice counselor, Kathleen Dowley Singh. Her book, The Grace in Dying, it is the cartography, the map of the entire inner process of dying. So I think it is essential reading as a human being. So she points out that you come into this world and you have no sense of self. There's no separation of you from environment. And that quickly begins to form. And that's a contraction of your consciousness to form ego. That's the first one. I am a self in an environment. Then there's a second contraction rapidly happening in which I realize there's animate and inanimate in the environment. Those objects that move, that interact with me and those that don't. So you're forming object relations. You're forming a sense of self separate from other. And then you realize you're a mind in a body. And that's the third contraction. So all this within the first few months, perhaps. Hmm. The fourth contraction is the major one where information and messages that reinforce the integrity of your ego identity become part of your persona, right? And, and the formation of that lived experience of self. But information and experiences which are do not supportive of ego identity that challenge it or threaten it without adequate instruments and wisdom to respond constructively to those, those get buried in the subconscious. So usually it's painful experiences. Um, and that builds, that's our homework throughout life. And then as uh, we move, right, we get a sister or a brother and our identity is changing. We go to a different grade, move to a different town. Uh, we grow up, meet a girlfriend, lose a girlfriend, meet another girlfriend, lose our girlfriend. Sorry, this isn't autobiographical. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, all of this changing and shaping who and what we are, and then we, we lose a job, we lose a marriage, we lose our keys, we lose our hair, we get a diagnosis and lose our life. Now ego deconstruction, in the reverse order that it was formed, heals what is in the subconscious when it's done well, uh, restores your sense of connection and relationship to your body, to which, you know, that you learn to love and then restores a connection to others and the inanimate through a sense of oneness with everything as you die. This is in the last stages. 
Uh, and then in the final stage, nearing death awareness, where you perceive spiritual entities and move to transpersonal states of consciousness, that returns you to the oneness, no separation from the world and reality. Brilliant model. Nobody does it smoothly. Right? Because to have your ego deconstructed creates, ex it's an existential evisceration. It ain't pretty. It's, ugh. And that's my job to help people with all of that. I think I went off on a tangent. Did I answer your question? Yes, <laughs> but I've, it's all right because I have another one. Okay. We're, <laughs> we're recording this show on Holocaust Remembrance Day. And at this moment in time, Putin has sent the Russian army to commit genocide in the Ukraine. So bearing major events like that in mind. David, give us your take on the causes and the nature of evil. Could you ask me a heavy question? <laughs> <laughs> evil. Evil. Well, we are our own worst enemy. We're very good at evil. We create most of the mess. Let's not attribute that to any demonic force or to the the will or fate or reasons of the divine, right? Too quickly. Let's not abdicate our responsibility in this catastrophe. I think um, collectively, I think there is a force of evil in collective consciousness. And in the mystical, that can manifest in very strange ways. They're frightening. However, there is a paradox at play. If God is love, then only love is real and nothing unreal exists. This pulls from the Course in Miracles, of course. So evil, I like to say, is like uh, C.S. Lewis portrayed evil as a puff of smoke, that the wind of grace just whew, gone. But in our world, uh, power, um, narcissism, uh, greed, the mythology of cultures, these combine to compel leaders to do outrageous things. And so I'm, I wouldn't hesitate to call what Putin is doing evil. And I hope that it mobilizes the whole world to pray, not to the external God, but as a participation, as instruments of grace, because the research shows that it's effective. Right? There was the Global Consciousness Project. There's the beautiful work of Lynn McTaggart, uh, the Institute of Noetic Sciences, all showing that mind is non-local and compassion has great power to affect people and situations at a distance. Um, it's a call for the world's countries to step up with responsibility, solidarity, and commitment, but we're not even doing that to save our own lives in the environment. So do I have hope? Um, I think it's going to get a lot worse before it gets better. But in the end, love wins. Yeah. So I'm going to love and shine as I can. And I hope all of your listeners will do the same. The more we do, the better things will be. That's yeah. for sure. I'd like to talk a little about what makes us human on a biological level and one of the things you mentioned and dealing with doctors who didn't really accept the science that would justify uh, the philosophy we've been talking about is that we're a construction of by light at different steps in, in our, in our evolving. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little about that. Yeah, th this is, um, thank you. Th this is a little pet peeve of mine, a, a lovely rabbit hole. I, I, I live in sometimes. We are literally beings of light. I know that medicine functions on uh, sort of a detective methodology, right? And it must, because it's dealing with the physical and the, 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 the crude levels, uh, the gr technically called the gross levels of metabolic functioning. However, um, it all begins with light. Uh, 
Dr. Stuart Hameroff, uh, working with Dr. Roger Penrose, who's a contemporary of Stephen Hawking, expert in quantum physics and black holes. Uh, they have articulated a theory of consciousness called orchestrative objective reductionism, in which a process we're now able to observe with modern technology uh, ensues within the DNA and the nervous system of our bodies. Light is spontaneously appearing. Photons are being emitted from the, uh, the myelin sheath around the nerves and through the DNA, infrared light at a specific frequency. And um, it is what they call uh, quantum wave fields that are uh, going to go gravitic collapse and shift into Newtonian energy and then pulse out of us every 50 nanoseconds. One pulse is a moment of now for us. The stream of them is consciousness and time. And the frequency and uh, amplitude of these particles of light initiates a cascade process which regulates all metabolic processes within the cells and thereby within the body. And this was emphasized by uh, Dr. Albert Leninger, who wrote Principles of Biochemistry. This is used as standard textbook in medical schools. And he talks about photonic emissions. It was one of his specialties and how this regulates all life force. And then you look at Fritz Albert Pop and his research and um, many others looking at how light is the um, manifestation of intelligence. It is the intermediary between uh, biology and biography, consciousness and physical reality. So um, spirituality really comes in there because when you're meditating, you can actually affect the frequency of quantum collapse within the microtubules and uh, really cool stuff. Okay. So that's a baseline that I actually offer to medical students and residents and doctors saying, well, this is what I'm doing. Like when I'm doing therapeutic touch, I'm basically working with the energy field through modulating my consciousness to resonate with this light. And, and you do it best by getting out of your own way. Don't try too hard to be that. You are that. So smile <laughs> and be kind and compassionate to that person. Is therapeutic touch the same as Reiki? Well, think of it all as languages. There are so many languages, but the point is to communicate. There are so many modalities. Reiki, Talington touch, quantum touch, Tai Chi, Qigong. You know, so many different modalities to uh, regulate and um, modulate and work with this biofield, right? Which now can be measured. You can get a photomultiplier um, and it can measure the light pouring out of the uh, third eye and out of the palm of your hands, a uh, supercooled quantum interference magnetometer, rather expensive, but we'll measure your biofield. And they found that the field from the heart leaps out the strongest, 10 to 12 times uh, stronger, or 10 to 12 feet, as can be measured by this device, but we see its non-local effects globally. And um, the, like Heart Math Institute is doing great research on this. Uh, there's simple breathing techniques you can use to calm yourself and amplify this energy of compassion and love. Beautiful stuff. Now, Jesus was talking about it all the time. He was very good at it. <laughs> uh, me, not so much, but we do what we can. Well, you, you do practice it. Tell us a little about uh, what, uh, um, what you've accomplished, maybe a couple of examples. I'll tell you what's been done through me. I have done nothing uh, but show up. Um, there, there's a case I, I share this in my book. I, I just love it. Um, doctor came to me and said, we got a patient who's allergic to all the antiemetics for chemotherapy. Now, those drugs prevent nausea, vomiting, adverse reactions to the chemotherapy, but he was a, allergic to them. So if we gave him the chemo, oh, he, it would be really bad. Uh, but how do we, how do we sedate him? And she said, you do that weird thing with your hands. <laughs> uh, why don't you go in there and uh, that, with that magic stuff? And I said, hey, it's not magic. It's based in science. And it's, and she, she, she cut me off and she said, just go do your job. <laughs> so I, I went to the patient and the nurse was there with the chemo. And I said, hi, I'm Dave. And uh, this is what I do. And uh, would you be okay with it? I'm going to be moving my hands over your body. I'm not going to touch you. 
move my hands over your body. And if it helps, you'll feel relaxed and the chemo hopefully won't bother you. And he says, let's give it a try. It couldn't hurt. And I got to have the chemo. I thought, man, what a brave guy. So I breathed in, I centered myself, you plant your feet, you open your heart. Right? You move in with curiosity, with gratitude. Got to let yourself feel, right? But, but even in that, observe your emotions. Because you, when you're moving into another person's biofield, you're going to pick up information and energy about their emotional state, about their existential state. And um, you got to be able to identify that's theirs, not mine. Right? And to identify your feelings, if you're getting emotional, you have the emotion, it doesn't have you, breathe into it, stay with it, don't suppress it, process it. And I did the assessment and moved my hands over his body, and then I began the, the treatment, gentle sweeping motions, and he closed his eyes as the nurse hung the chemo and began the drip. And I stayed and gave the treatment throughout the treatment, about half an hour. And then I uh, stepped back and I, I said, okay, we're done. And he opens his eyes and he says, wow, that felt like a massage of light. You know, now oh. I smiled, but inside I was going, yes, it's great. <laughs> yes. Then my ego could <laughs> jump up and down. <laughs> <laughs> he did great no side effects from the, the chemo and i continued to give him treatments for all of his uh, chemotherapy treatments that was great i go back to the nursing desk and it was lovely because uh, the doctor looked up she was charting and she said how'd it go and i said went great no side effects chemo's going in smoothly responded well she said good thanks david mm. no big thing isn't that great i'm so lucky to work with the people i work with yes wow I gave another treatment to a nurse who had strained her foot and another nurse saw me doing this. She looked over my shoulder and she freaked out because she could see the energy flowing out of my hands and around right the foot. And she said, what, what is that? What are you doing? Huh. I, I, I said, I'm giving therapeutic touch to Kathy. And Kathy looks up. Kathy's a joker. <laughs> <laughs> and Kathy says, oh yeah, Pat. Oh, and it feels really cool. You want to try it? <laughs> and she could see Pat's freaking out. And she says, stop it. Stop what you're doing to me. And I said, I'm not doing anything to you. If you can see this, it's because you're gifted. Don't do this to me, David. What you see is what you get. That's the way the world works. I wow. Said, Interesting. So we chatted afterwards. She, of course, seeing ghostly, smoky, weird, silvery stuff thought she was losing her mind because her framework of reality was blown. And we talked about that. Now she's cool with it. Now she's cool. It's wonderful. That opening uh, of yourself um, sounds like a, a good formula for prayer or for group prayer for that matter. Yeah. Yeah. To open, to not control. Right. Spiritual practice requires no control on your part, just availability. There must be ambiguity. That's why it's so hard. We like to be in control. We like to think we're doing a good job. And there, there are electromagnetic changes, aren't there, uh, wrought by group prayer? Yeah, um, so Lynn McTaggart's work shows that small groups work best, and that's consistent with the world's traditions and the teachings of Christ. So she was looking at groups of 8 to 12. Interesting, eh? Mm. And um, it amplifies the biofield of everyone, and um, uh, that that's cool. There have been experiments conducted where you, you hook trees up to basically lie detector te uh, devices, and you see their biofields and electromagnetic signatures synchronizing and, and amplifying. And when it's happening, uh, there's a resonance with the Schumann resonance, right? That's the dominant field of the magnetic, uh, dominant frequency of the magnetic field of the planet. So that, that's really lovely. The studies showing crime rates go down in cities where group meditation. Wouldn't it be cool if you went to church and they had galvanic skin response monitors sitting in the pew? 
and you were trained in centering prayer and meditation. Then you had a little needle up on the, the big screen showing, oh, we're almost, yeah, we're in the green zone. Okay, <laughs> that, that'd be great. Of course, it, it wouldn't work. We'd, we'd, we'd get into it and think, oh, we're doing such a good job, and then you've blown it. Yeah. The uh, Society of Friends, the Quakers, who, who have silent meetings, and everyone is considered to be a pastor, at least that's the tradition, mm. uh, and may be moved by the spark of God within them to stand up and say something from time to time. But basically, the meeting is silent. And uh, it'd be interesting, I think, especially in, in a setting like that, to be measuring the, uh, the electromagnetic charges in the, in the hands. See yeah. if that if that is a better form of worship than uh, than the uh, or ritual prayer and sermonizing and the like. Yeah, it's so weird to realize that I was trained in the book, read the prayer from the book, do mm -hmm. the liturgy, right? Yeah. How many Sundays I did that without realizing my heart was empty, or without really knowing the potential of what I was doing, to hold my hands over the the Eucharist and say the prayer. You know, I remember days where I truly opened up. My hands were tingling, fierce. And then we introduced therapeutic touch in worship. Where after people received Holy Communion, they would stay at the rail and I would, I would move along and I would place my hands over their forehead. Looks like the laying on of hands. Mm -hmm. We'd pour the energy in. This, this is a Lutheran service, much like Anglican and Catholic. What most people didn't know was I had a plant. I had a person in the back who could see auras and energy fields. And every Sunday afterwards, we'd sit down together and she'd tell me what she saw during the service. That was interesting. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yesterday, we discovered we were both uh, fans of the Matrix movies. And, uh, oh, goody. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I don't think I told you then that my wife and I named our male and female cats born last year from the same litter, Neo and Trinity. So, oh, Lee, that's a bit much, don't you think? <laughs> <laughs> and, well, perhaps. Anyway, the, the Matrix premise is that, all, that mankind invents artificial intelligence after which AI enslaves us by creating an imaginary world of ones and zeros to live in. And in a talk you gave at IONS in uh, 2018, you showed a little clip of a physicist describing how he thought he had discovered that our world is actually built of ones and zeros. Tell us, tell us about that. Yeah, um, that was a, a conference. I'm just going to pull it up here on YouTube. I I don't think I'll be able to share it, but I'm going to be able to give you enough information that your your listeners will be able to go to it. So I think the physicist's name is James Gleck. And uh, let me type it in here. Um, I'm sorry for the delay. Uh, no, that's fine. Neil deGrasse Tyson, I'm putting in all these um, keywords. And I think this physicist is, uh, is into string yeah, theory as his... Uh... Yeah. understanding of the so, way the universe is constructed when you go to youtube type in the youtube search neil degrasse tyson freaks out when <laughs> physicist <laughs> when physicist james gates finds intelligent code in fabric of space now that's going to grab your attention it's so good because this is old i mean this one was posted five years ago but i know the event happened older than that so uh james uh gates is his name he's a physicist and he found um a pattern in the fabric of space-time as he was analyzing randomness and, you know some chaos theory going on there and this code was identical to a code developed decades earlier by a computer programmer. Um, and he says, this leads me to conclude that we are indeed living in a hologram. We're living in the matrix. And Neil deGrasse Tyson just freaks out in the, in the best way. It's so good to watch. And it's only five <laughs> minutes long. So 
have a look. It it, it does. It blows your mind. <laughs> yeah. Especially if I, you're in, into that movie because it's it is so dramatized in the movie that you you think, oh well, there it is. You know, it's the green st- streaming down of zeros and ones. Yeah, it was actually computer code. Now, this is relevant to near-death experiences and to the, or the nature of reality. Let's do a little reality check right now. Astronomers, cosmologists, the, among the most brilliant scientists, tell us now that what you see is not what you get. We perceive reality in the visible spectrum of light. Well, apparently that makes up 0.004% of the universe. All of the matter in the universe beyond the visible spectrum of light. So all the matter, all the stuff, that comprises 4% of the universe. Over 20% is comprised of something called dark matter, which cannot be observed directly, uh, only be observed by its effects upon the pull of galactic clusters and gravity. And then over 70% of the universe is made of dark energy, which is a scientific word for voodoo witchcraft. We don't know what this is, but it works in the math. (laughs) Now, here we are, modern human beings, putting all of our chips on the 0.004% and saying, when I'm dead, I'm dead. That's pretty short-sighted. That's not a good bet. Let's go even further. You and I are incapable of perceiving reality as it is. We can only perceive it through the the five or possibly six senses, right? And the wetware of our brain. Uh, And we only perceive it, we only perceive the information that facilitates our physical survival in this evolutionary physical plane. The reality that a butterfly experiences or that a whale perceives or a dog perceives or an insect is radically different than the one we perceive. We forget that. It's part of ethnocentrism uh, on an existential, not just a cultural level. And then you've got Dr. James Gates saying, we live in a hologram. Uh, Quantum physicists saying, Yes, that's the most robust and uh, sound model of reality that we live in a projection from a higher dimensional reality. Uh, That reconciles Newtonian and quantum physics. That makes everything we've discovered fall into one unified theory of reality, a model of, of, of a reality that all emanates from consciousness. Well, that's just a contemporary language for the ancient mystical terms. God, spirit, right? And that we are in communion and relationship with the unseen levels of consciousness all around us. I think that is exciting, innovating, and um, that's why I love the Matrix and the special (laughs) effects. (laughs) David, this has been uh, wonderful talking with you. And uh, I I, I want to thank you so much for sharing not only the story of your NDE, but all of the, all of the thought that it has provoked in your life since then. Um, if listeners would like to learn more about your chaplaincy work or get a copy of your book, how could they get in touch? Oh, thank you. Uh, DavidMcGinley.com. So my last name is spelled differently. It's M-A-G-I-N-L-E-Y davidmcginley.com. And there you can see my book, which um, describes my four rounds of cancer. And then it weaves that with patient stories of facing cancer and mortality. And then third thread is the reflections on how do we not only go through cancer, but grow through cancer? How do we use it to amplify life and deepen our love and connect to our fundamental spiritual nature? So that I'm, I'm so surprised by that book because it's much better than anything i ever wrote in university i was such a mediocre student and avoided (laughs) homework all the time but this seemed to flow through me and it's helped thousands so i'm i'm so happy about that oh and from there you can jump to my facebook page and all the the media stuff that's required for these sort of things 
Well, thank you so much. This has been great. It's really been thank you. wonderful having you on the show. If, I'm if listen- so grateful, Lee. Yeah. Oh. I just want to say thank you, Lee, for all the stuff that you do and all of these shows. And I want to encourage your listeners just to keep shining in your own way because the world needs your light. Oh, more than ever right now. Yeah. If listeners would like to hear the show again or any of our more than 450 archived ad-free NDE interviews, go to TalkZone's NDE radio site and hit the Past Shows button. Or go to our YouTube channel, NDE Radio with Lee Whitting, where you can subscribe to and comment on the complete NDE Radio library. And be sure to check out our NDE Radio Facebook page. Just search NDE Radio with Lee Whitting on your Facebook app. And listen next Monday, 11 a.m. Eastern at Talk Zone for more NDE Radio. I'm your host, Lee Whitting, saying thanks for listening.